Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. If you're watching these videos, you know we're in the COVID-19 shutdown, so I'm teaching online via YouTube. You're either watching this because you're in my class, so learn what I teach you the way that I teach you and follow along in your note set. If you're not in my class and you stumbled across this in YouTube land, there's probably more or different information. We all teach things a little bit differently. I found a system that works for me and my students. I tend to trim the material down early on and then we add the details later on so that you understand what those details mean. So I keep it simple early. You may have a lot more information that your instructor is pouring on you. Learn it the way that they want you to learn it. I hope these videos help that information make sense. If they do, please hit like and subscribe so uh, I can continue to uh, know if I need to continue to do this once the, the COVID uh, shutdown is over. I'm thinking of setting up a permanent YouTube channel and doing really slick, nice videos just for all students in AMP because I'm getting some really good feedback. Anyway, if you don't like my videos, let me know what I can do better. All right. So we have been talking about connective tissues. We just started connective tissues and we talked about the cell populations and the matrix of each. Now we're going to look at specific connective tissues and where their location and function is. Essentially, you should be able to make the outline that I made in the last video over here about epithelium, connective muscle, and neural. List the five different epithelial tissues that we've talked about and what is the location and function of each. Now we're going to go through connective tissue proper. We're already done with fluid connective tissue. I finished it in the last video. And then we'll go on to supportive connective tissues. You need to know where the different subtypes of connective tissue proper are found and what their functions are. And then you need to do the same for all the cartilages and for bone tissue. All right, so let's get started. Again, I don't know what page we're on in my note set. I simply know it's the page on the note set that talks about the tissue matrix and the cell populations. We're on the part where it says connective tissue proper and says loose, adipose, dense, and so on. Okay, so for connective tissue proper, there's different types of connective tissue proper. Their appearance affects their functioning. Form fits function in biology, so it's always important to know the anatomy or the form of things. So, when it comes to connective tissue proper, there are different subtypes. One of those subtypes is called areolar, or also sometimes referred to as loose connective tissue. And some books call it loose areolar connective tissue. It's all the same thing. When we look at areolar connective tissue, when we looked at it in the laboratory, you saw that it had these really thick pink fibers running across the tissue in all these different directions. It's very loosely organized and arranged, okay? Those thick pink fibers we said were called collagen fibers. And as we said in the last video, collagen makes it very, very strong, but from a different number of directions, okay? Also in this tissue, we said that very often we can find these very thin, dark fibers running through the tissue like this. Although this marker is not as dark as I'd like it to be, but we'll see these thin, dark fibers. Those thin, dark fibers were called elastic fibers. Elastic fibers make it very flexible. So areolar connective tissue is both somewhat strong and very flexible. And then all of the space in between all these fibers would be like, um, it's a syrupy matrix. I don't know if you've ever been to an aquarium where they have, usually they have an exhibit that has like uh, the, the support beams for uh, uh, an oil derrick or something. And because there's barnacles and all sorts of wildlife that develops a whole ecosystem around that. And you see the poles and the pipes and everything laying in there. Or if you look in a fish tank, there's the plants and the little diver guy and the bridge and everything that you put in there. All that plus the water would be the matrix. The fish would be the cells floating around in that matrix. The matrix would be very syrupy. And so when we look in this tissue, we see lots of different cells and it just looks like a nucleus suspended in here, but every one of those would have a membrane around it. And those cells, most of them, would be called fibroblasts, okay? Now, <clears throat> connective tissue proper, particularly, or I should say areolar connective tissue, has lots of collagen fibers for strength, elastic fibers for flexibility, and lots of fibroblasts floating around in the syrupy matrix. And there's not a lot of places we find it. 
essentially the location for this tissue is is found in the dermis of the skin when we learn the skin we're going to learn that there's the epidermis and there's the dermis and then there's another layer called the hypodermis we did that on the model the dermis is actually made up of a couple of layers there's a reticular layer and a papillary layer and each layer has more of this tissue or that one of those layers of the dermis of the skin is filled with loose connective tissue or areolar connective tissue that makes our skin very flexible so when we flex it we let go it usually snaps back and it's also very strong it's hard to rip it off the body because of the collagen fibers okay as we age by the way these proteins break down and our ability to, re to uh, replace them declines and so our skin loses its strength and flexibility another a couple of other things three things that I know can help damage these fibers and make it more to where your skin starts to break down and look it, it ages you more rapidly one is too much UV light exposure Ultraviolet light from the sun can help break down these proteins amongst other harmful uh, conditions uh, or harmful effects. Alcohol, if you drink a whole lot of alcohol and if you smoke. So think about people who tan, smoke and drink too much and their skin starts to lose its elasticity and that nice young healthy look to it and starts to break down and really become rather wrinkly and all of that. But essentially the function is strength and flexibility for attachment of the dermis to the underlying connective tissues. So the major function of this tissue is attachment of the epidermis to underlying tissues. That's so that your epidermis just doesn't slide off your body, okay? So that's it for areolar connective tissue. You should know what it looks like, you should know what's found in it, and you should know its location and function, all right? Okay, now the next connective tissue proper we're gonna look at is gonna be dense connective tissue. I'm gonna do them a little bit out of order, like I do in lab, because it makes sense to me that way. Um, for dense connective tissue, there's two different types. There's actually um, a, a fibrous, a dense fibrous connective tissue or white fibrous connective tissue and there's another one called dense irregular we're going to talk about fibrous or dense fibrous connective tissue or white fibrous connective tissue we're just going to call it dense connective tissue when we look at dense connective tissue under the microscope and lab one of the things that we see is that we see that the collagen fibers are all running in the exact same direction and it's almost entirely collagen fibers. There are elastic fibers, but they are very few and far between. So we know that this tissue is very strong. And we will see some fibroblast nuclei crammed in there in certain places. So those would be fibroblasts found in there. It's the exact same stuff as loose connective tissue, but it's very densely packed and the fibers all run the same direction. The location is Ligaments and tendons. Ligaments connect bones to bones. Tendons connect muscles to bones. So we find these where their joints are, where two different bones would meet. For example, if we look at the knee, the end of this long bone, we're gonna learn in lab, called the femur, looks something like this. These two bones down here, one of them somewhat follows the shape of the femur, and then another one is rather skinny on the outside, called the tibia and the fibula. This would be medial, this would be lateral. Your knee takes a tremendous amount of stress. If I'm running and I stop, Upwards of 6 to 12 times my body weight could be trying to continue the femur on the tibia and the knee can tear, tear apart. So Mother Nature surrounded it with all this dense connective tissue. And we'll see this dense connective tissue on the lateral side up here. So a lot of times we refer to that as the LCL or lateral collateral ligament. We're going to talk about the knee joint later on. And there's one on the inside called the MCL, the medial collateral ligament. 
We also have two ligaments inside that crisscross. One runs in front of the other called the anterior cruciate or ACL and the posterior cruciate or PCL. So the ACL and the PCL, these are called cruciate ligaments. Crucifix means to cross. ACL is anterior, PCL is posterior. And what those ligaments all do is they help your, to stabilize the knee joint. So the function of this tissue is strength for stabilizing joints. Not just your knee, but many other joints in the body. The elbow, the wrist, all of your movable joints, the shoulder. When we're throwing a ball, all those ligaments are helping the, the joints not rip apart under stress. So those are the ligaments. They connect bones to bones at joints and help stabilize or hold the joint together. Okay. Now, I'm going to erase some of this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the ligament, I mean the tendons. So if I were to look at, say, the knee joint from a lateral view, so now I'm looking at the knee from the outside. There's a bone here, the femur, and the lower leg bones, one is called the tibia, and you have muscles. You have all these muscles on your, the front of your thigh and the muscles on the back of your femur, the back back here, the hamstrings, and those muscles are going to connect to these bones like this. And this would be the tendon. This tendon actually happens to have another piece of bone in there called the kneecap. But there's a tendon here and some tendons on the back side. Those tendons connect muscles to bones so that when the muscles pull, they actually move the joints. And they also provide strength. Um, for joint movement and for stability of the joint, okay? So they really kind of do the same thing. They provide a lot of strength for joint stability and tendons are so that muscles can pull on them. Just like if I had a rope attached to the car, if I'm the muscle, the rope would be the tendon and it moves the car. The muscle contracts, pulls on the tendon, which moves the bone. So tendons connect muscles to bones, they do provide strength for stabilizing joints and they connect the muscle to the bone so that the bone can move, uh, the muscle can move the bone for joint movement. So joint stability and joint movement. More stability here, more movement with tendons. That's where we find dense connective tissue, ligaments and tendons. Now I'm gonna go back to adipose connective tissue and before I talk about too much about it, I wanna, well, I'll show you this in a moment. But for connective tissue proper, the last one we're going to talk about is called adipose connective tissue. Adipose connective tissue is what we call fat or adipose tissue. Okay? Now, fibroblasts are going to grow up to secrete collagen and elastic fibers, whether they're in loose or dense connective tissue. But sometimes those fibroblasts decide, I don't want to do that. There's some genetic programming in them that makes them turn on different genes so that they simply store lipids, adipose, fat, in these little bubbles called vacuoles like we talked about for adipose tissue in lab. So when we look at adipose tissue, it's really just those empty looking adipose sites filled with lip, uh, lipid droplets or a fat vacuole. Their function is that they store fat. So we find it wherever there's fat on the body and what we call the hypodermis of the skin. The hypodermis is not part of the skin, it's a layer of adipose tissue just below the skin. And there, the hypodermis, it's filled with adipose tissue. The functions of the hypodermis is one, it provides padding. So where we are designed to actually bump into the outside world, we have a lot of adipose, like the fat pads on the palms of your hand and the soles of your feet. We don't have them on the forehead or the elbow because we're not really supposed to be hitting things with that. We're supposed to be touching the world with the palms of our hands, the soles of our feet, and the buttocks. We also store some fat in the abdomen, okay? So we can find it in the hypodermis of the skin and in the abdomen. And um, there, it's not only for padding, but it can store nutrients. 
Remember, lipids can be used for energy. When we talked about the four major organic compounds, we would prefer to burn sugar for energy, but if we have to, we can burn lipids or fat. So fat provides padding, and it can store lipids or nutrients for energy in things. Another thing that fat can do is it provides insulation. So the more adipose tissue you have on your body, the more heat you can store, the warmer you are, and you might be able to withstand a colder environment than somebody who's real skinny and thin and doesn't have a lot of padding and lipid storage. They can't store as much heat, so adipose tissue can trap heat as well and act as an insulator. So, now there's a section in the notes that says read about yellow fat and brown fat. You can read about that if you like. It's not on the test, but go ahead and read about it, okay? So those are the three connective tissue propers, but there's one more that we need to talk about. We did not look at this one in lab, at least in my lab, but for connective tissue proper, there's a fourth one called reticular tissue. Reticular tissue sometimes looks a little bit like loose connective tissue, but it has these fibers, these little protein fibers, that actually sometimes look like little coils. They almost look like a little spring. And so this tissue is filled with what we call reticular fibers. And they are rather, I think of them as being springy, sort of a Mr. Long term. And it is found, the location of this tissue is in what we call the stroma, which means framework, of some viscera. For example, the liver, the spleen, and we sometimes find them in lymph nodes. Their function is they help maintain support and shape of the tissue. That's my little and sign. They provide support and shape. They're very springy. You can stretch or smash the tissue and it will spring back because of the reticular fibers in addition to elastin and collagen. Now, if I take most of the innards of an animal, like uh, all the guts, and I take the intestines, and you were to press on the intestines real hard and take your fingers, you would see where you pressed. It would take a long time for that to come out. If you take the liver or the spleen and you smash them and you let go, they will snap back to their original shape because of all the reticular fibers. It helps maintain their shape and support the tissue, gives it a specific shape. If I take the intestines and I flop them on a table, they're just gonna go and sit there. If I take a piece of liver and toss it on a table, it's gonna bounce across the table and bounce across the floor and be all floppy and springy because of the reticular tissue. So we find it in the stroma or framework of some of our viscera, like the liver, spleen, and lymph nodes, and it helps provide their shape and gives them support, okay? Lots of reticular fibers. So that's it for connective tissue proper. I'm gonna wrap this video up. Let me make sure I didn't skip anything I'm supposed to talk about. Um, nope, we're done with this page of notes. We're gonna move on. The next page talks about fluid connective tissues. We've already covered those. So in the next video, I'm gonna start off on the page that has the support of connective tissues. We're gonna talk about cartilage and bone, and then we're pretty close to being done um, with this chapter and moving on to the integument, getting ready for the next test. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I hope you learned something. Do it till you can't stand it. Do it till you understand it. And then do it five more times. You got to work this stuff over and over and over until you get good at it. Or else you can give up on your hopes of getting through this course. Okay. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.